my name is Adam Hunt. I am the communications lead for Breeding Resources Initiative, Accelerated Breeding Initiative, and Excellence in Breeding. So welcome to the um, Genetic Innovation First All Process Teams webinar. Uh, so I'm going to take you very quickly through the agenda. Um, we have a gift for you this morning already, which is it's scheduled for an hour and a half. We're going to do our very best to end 15 minutes early. Um, so the schedule today looks like uh, an introduction from Sharifa, then a section on why we were formalizing process management from Stefan Weber, then a panel discussion, then uh, a look at process management in industry from Brian Gardunia from Bayer, then some Q&A, and then we'll wrap up with uh, John Derrera. So that's today's agenda, hopefully finishing about 15 minutes earlier than your invitation says. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sharifa, who is the Senior Director of CGIR's uh, Breeding Research Services, which also oversees the Breeding Resource uh, Initiative. So take it away, Sharifa. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Adam. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining this webinar, especially those from Asia side, because I know this is probably late already to work on a Friday night, but well, so special thanks to you guys. Um, let's get straight in. Um, first slide, uh, Adam. Thanks. Um, so let's start off by reminding ourselves why we are here working for 1CG. Uh, the vision of 1CG, um, and I will read this as I want to get the phrasing correct, a world with sustainable and resilient food, land and water systems that deliver diverse, healthy, safe, sufficient and affordable diets and ensure improved livelihoods and greater social equality within planetary and regional environmental boundaries. And the mission is to deliver science and innovation that advance <coughs> the transformation of food, land, and water systems in a climate crisis. And we are enabled um, to do this as a cohesive organization with a single mission, leveraging on our over 50 years worth of capabilities and assets for the benefit of mankind and planet. So if that is not a noble cause, I don't know what is. What, what is. So that's what we are all here for. Next slide. Um, so the genetic innovation then takes this of the vision and mission of CG and put emphasis further on the need to work as a single genetic operation with a global footprint. To do this, we need to work as a strategic operation, as one strategic <coughs> operation, not as centers or initiatives. Those are just vehicles for us to deliver our mission. Next slide, please. Um, so the breeding process model, as shown here, provides a pathway towards this through standardized operations and processes so that continuous improvement of breeding program can happen. The BPM for short um, provide a structure to manage the complex breeding processes across organizations and crops, providing a resilient framework for continuous improvement. You will notice that each process categories um, has direct link and ownership to both the genetic innovation departments and also the initiatives. It takes into account the end-to-end -end breeding processes from market intelligence all the way to product delivery and also the recurring processes that are needed for efficient breeding operations. Next slide, please. So for this model to have an impact and deliver on the vision and mission of 1CG and GI, it must be operationalized. An operational structure that looks like this pyramid here with the appropriate documentations has been established as a framework for the model. At the very top of this operational structure sits the process steering team, uh, which at the moment is comprised of the GI management team, um, Sonia as the managing director and myself and my colleagues, the senior directors, who are, and we are responsible to provide strategic directions, ensures resource availability and remove risks and roadblocks. At each level of this structure, the process categories, uh, process groups, the processes itself, the activities and tasks are assigned to various levels of teams. Uh, Adam, if you can do one click. Um, OK, so this includes, um, uh, so the teams uh, include the process management teams, 
the process core teams and the process sub teams. And these teams are crop and center agnostic, working together to map the processes and establish the documents and standards that is needed to establish a cohesive organization following the vision and mission of 1CG and GI that was mentioned earlier. Now, let, let's look at an example how this has been done uh, in, in, in real um, action at the moment now. So let's look at an example. So one click, please. Another click, Adam. Thanks. Um, um, <clears throat> so the, the example that is given here is the lab um, service processes. It sits within the recurring breeding operation process categories, along with two other process groups, the trialing and nursery and breeding analytics. And within the lab service process group, three processes have been identified, uh, which is the service request, the service itself, and the service delivery. And within the process, the process, uh, the the service request process, uh, specific activities um, have been um, uh, developed that will achieve the intended outcome of the process. Um, so this, in this case, um, the service request process itself. Uh, 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 in this case, the demand focus, forecast, um, the order planning, order creation, everything that contributes to the service request. So as you can see, there is a hierarchy that connects um, the structure from sub teams um, that are doing the activities all the way to the GI management team that forms the steering team. So together, the teams, the documentations, the process mapping exercise uh, create a, a ways um, of working, uh, new ways of working that will establish the fundamentals for an organization such as 1CG to work together to drive excellence. Uh, next slide, please. So um, as mentioned earlier, the process teams are cross-functional, cross-center and cross-crops. Um, they, they function um, to provide uh, an inclusive, transparent and robust data-driven decision-making platform for sustained management, continuous improvement, and digital enablement for CG and NARS breeding network. Through this platform, GI department and teams are connected, having a structured way of working, thus ensuring delivery of desired outputs in an effective and efficient manner through industry standard management methodologies. Uh, essentially, they drive the standards that are linked to the breeding process model. Um, uh, next slide, and this will be my last slide. OK, so this last slide um, showed um, actual teams that are operating at the moment. Um, the product development process teams led by Sarah Hearn from ABI, uh, trialing and nursery process team led by Gustavo Teixeira, lab services process team led by Eng Hua, and breeding analytics process team led by Bert um, uh, are already in, in operation. So other teams will join as we expand to include those in market intelligence, seed equal and gene bank. And um, before I end my section, uh, I want to personally thank these teams for doing such a fantastic job, contributing to the transformational uh, shift that we want to make in 1CG. And now I will pass the presentation to Stefan, who, will, who has been helping us establish all this, and he will elaborate further on why we need to formalize the process management. Take it away, Stefan. Thank you. Hey. OK, thank, thank you, Sharifa. Um, just to note that we will have a, a panel discussion and Q&A after this, and Sharifa will be on that panel if you have some questions for her. Um, so I'll hand it over to Stefan Weber, who is a management consultant with uh, Weber and Fritz Consultant Consulting, who has been working with uh, the Breeding Research Services and the Breeding Resources Initiative on this uh, process management uh, process. So I'll give it to you, Stefan. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Sharifa. Well, first of all, I, I uh, want to thank you and I wanna, I wanna elaborate a little bit on um, Sharifa presented the vision, the mission, uh, and also the high level structure. I want to go in a little bit more into detail and explain why, why do you need to formalize process management? So uh, first of all, that the CG NAS networks, they are meant to be collaborative um, multi-institution partnerships. Basically, as any other breeding operation, they deliver key out, two key outputs. One is data, uh, which you use to advance the germplasm, which is the other uh, output uh, from, from breeding um, uh, processes, um, to basically at the end, 
as product candidates to, to uh, the NAS partners or as, as varieties to the farmers. And, and for, for obtaining a really good quality, um, and also to get um, 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 well to, to get the quality that is needed, um, the, the, the performance, you need operations that connect through harmonized processes. So you heard from Sharifa about the connected operations, the connection, the connection of operations actually happens through the processes. Next slide, please. So keeping that in mind, um, the, 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 the mission or the vision desire for CGIAR genetic innovations working as a single genetics operation with a global footprint um, to deliver data germplasm and seed products, uh, this is the, the, the flow of, of processes. You have data in germplasm, which you work through your breeding processes, which are actually the know-how of the organization that you would like to document because you do not want to sit it in single heads or with individuals that if they leave the organization, the knowledge is gone. Uh, but this is the basic flow. So this is one of the reasons why we have process teams. The process teams, they are really there to drive the harmonization and the connectivity. They do this by mapping the baseline processes and the baseline is the keyword because without a baseline, you cannot improve. And continuous improvement is the is the big um, target here for for the uh, for the organization. Uh, you can't improve if you don't have a baseline, and that's what the process teams are mainly busy with at the moment. Next slide, please. So there is a number of benefits uh, to the organization of having uh, the process teams and having a process orientation. Um, you can you can read this. I want to point out one of the benefits for each individual process steward and for each member on the process teams is actually the last bullet point here. You have an opportunity to grow as individuals. You will work across your crops, across your boundaries. You will get to know uh, new people, other people. You will see how things work in other crops. This is actually where innovation happens. You get the ideas there through best practice sharing. And at the end, that should all lead to better germplasm, which in turn should lead to better varieties for the farmers delivered at a faster pace, uh, which is the ultimate goal for genetic innovations. Next slide, please. So you are all, uh, you're on the call, you're all process stewards uh, on the process teams already. So you know the high level structure. This is just to recall and explain the central role that you play. So the process owner supported by the process consultant, they together, they, they lead the core teams. Uh, you know them, uh, Sharifa mentioned the, the, the names. We have four teams running at the moment. Uh, we, we would like to start more teams once those uh, functions are ready. Um, and uh, the process owner and the process consultants pretty much operate on the global level. Well, to really make this operational, you need to get to the, the centers, to the crops, to the teams, to the stations. And this is this is the, the bridge to that is really the role of the process stewards. So the process stewards, they need to connect the sub teams to the core teams. And this is actually where the flow happens. And if you move on to the next slide, um, you can all access the role description of each of those roles that you have seen before. I don't want to go into detail. If you wonder where to find those role descriptions, which are actually more detailed, ask your process consultant. They can point you uh, to those descriptions. But just to recall, the process owner is the person ultimately responsible for the performance of a process. Uh, and this is measured by, does it realize the objectives, uh, which is basically measured through KPIs. The process consultant's role is really a, a mix of um, providing expertise on process management and on project management. Because when you make continuous improvement, um, you need to know how you map a process, how you optimize a process, and you would also uh, need to, um, to know how you manage projects to manage change. So that is that role. Um, the next slide, Adam. The process stewards um, really have the, the responsibility for an instance of a process. So think global, but 
the execution actually happens at the station. So this is where the process stewards uh, uh, act and they work together with the subject matter experts in their local teams. Those are the people with the hands on, on those processes. So just to recall the roles, if you hit the next slide or the next button, well, People need to work together. Uh, for those of you who enjoy a good read, I can recommend uh, this book here, Sapiens from um, no Yuval Harari. It's a very interesting read um, and uh, he speaks a lot. He's an historian and he speaks a lot of societies and organizations success uh, depend on not what they invent, all the tools and etc. They depend on how well they collaborate with each other. Uh, so take the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, the Romans beat the, beat the Greeks not because they had better weapons or they were the better people. They beat them because they were better organized. So if you hit the, the next uh, button, um, what we want to get to is to, to get to a superior collaboration model, which is called team of teams. And to build this, um, to get to this requires to build a shared consciousness between the individuals. So you are all process stewards on different process teams. We need to build that community and to establish also relationships between the process stewards for enable the teams to cooperate uh, with, each, with each other. Uh, not in a top-down structure, but really in an agile and a collaborative um, uh, way of working. And this is what we, what we want to accomplish with the process teams. And if you hit the next button, so um, what, Remember what, what Sharifa said about one organization. Remember the one CG goals. One C, uh, CG wants to move from silos um, to be a cohesive organization. Well, that's not news. Many organizations want to do that, but there is one, one thing that you need to know. Next button. Um, there is unfortunately no shortcut. And uh, this goes back to research that uh, has been done by management consultings. Uh, but also by organizational uh, design um, uh, researchers. Um, you, you, you cannot go directly from silos to a cohesive organization. If you hit the, last, the, the, the next button, which will be my last, you always go through first through a phase of chaos and then through a, first of, to, through a phase of bureaucracy. Some organizations, they go from silos to chaos, find out hmm, doesn't work, they go back to silos. Some get to bureaucracy, get stuck there. There's only very few that make it to a cohesive organization, like for instance, Toyota. But uh, knowing this uh, is actually really important because there is an effort needed and there is some bureaucracy needed, but we have the aim to make the short, the time of chaos and bureaucracy as short as possible. And that that's why it's important to formalize process management. And with that, Thanks a very thanks very much, and uh, I get give it back to Adam for the panel discussion. Okay, thank you, Stefan. Right on time, in fact, maybe even thirty seconds early, which means we have a, about twenty five minutes and thirty seconds for our panel discussion and Q and A. And so, if I could invite uh, four people to turn their cameras on, um, and then I'll take this slide down. So we have with us right now. Um, Sharifa Syed Alwi, who we met earlier in the presentation, who is the Senior Director of Reading Research Services. And we have John Dorera, who is also a, C a CGIR uh, Senior Director for uh, Plant Breeding and Pre-Breeding. And then we have two members of the Process Steward Teams, uh, Process Service Teams. Um, we have Rajaguru Bohar, who is a Regional Genotyping Lead with Breeding Resources Initiative and he is the process steward for the lab services process team. And we have Carolina St. Pierre with who works with uh, Cement Wheat, and she is a process steward as well for the trialing and nursery process team. So uh, I will stop sharing my screen. So we'll just have the, the participants. Um, there we are. OK, welcome, everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, so I, uh, I'm going to start off with a couple of questions just to the panelists and feel free to discuss and, and make it conversational. Um, and then we're, we will 
also take some questions from participants. So participants, if you would like to raise your hand in a couple minutes, that's great. Or if you'd like to put a uh, question in the chat, that's also fantastic. We'll make sure that the participants um, address your, your question or comment. Okay, so the first question is to um, Sharifa and John, who are sort of at our leadership level uh, in this process. Um, so human nature is really, um, really has people thinking, well, that's great, but what's in it for me? And so if you're uh, a, a standard breeder or an operation staff, um, how will this process, how will the process teams benefit you and your work? Um, John, do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah, I can, I can take that. Yeah, th thanks Adam. It's a very important question actually, because in every game, we have to make sure that we place people at the core uh, of everything. So in this case, you see that through the process teams, it's an opportunity to strengthen career development for our people. There's a lot of exchange of knowledge, a lot of learnings uh, that are happening through these uh, process teams. So that actually it prepares people to fit in with the changes that you are making in the organization that they'll be able to play the new roles. But most importantly, people are participating in developing the standard operation procedures and the way we want to implement the strategy for C1CG. So it's an involvement uh, that is fostering a lot of internal collaboration and alignment. So it's an opportunity for everyone to participate in GI. Thank you. Thanks, Sharifa. Over to you, Sharifa. Yeah, um, maybe I just add a bit, uh, and I like to use this word. I think um, CG, the the scientific excellence in CG, uh, um, we don't have to talk about that. Uh, we've got many scientists, but I think through this exercise, through this activity that we're doing with process teams, um, uh, trying to improve the um, op uh, operations, uh, standardize the operations, um, and having people train in that, we are building operational excellence within CG as well. And if you look at many um, global companies, these are the two areas, uh, especially uh, research companies or seed companies, these are two um, equal areas that people put emphasis on. So it's, it's uh, I, I'm happy to see that we are moving um, on the operational excellence while keeping the scientific excellence, um, um, maintaining that and even going beyond um, uh, what we have achieved um, so far. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So Sharifa and John, um, do you think we're starting to see some of those benefits already um, or are we a little bit too early in the transition to see most of those benefits? Um, uh, if I can go, so I, I think so, um, Adam. Um, I think now, um, as you can see, and I mentioned earlier as well, the teams are now working um, cross centers. People are no longer bound to their center. Um, they are learning from each other across center from different crops. Uh, although we want to have a standard uh, breeding process uh, pipeline, so to speak, but there are things to learn um, when you put different crops, people working on different crops together. So, so it's happening already now and you're, you're sharing knowledge, sharing experiences. So I think that's one of the aim of this whole thing. So it, it's already happening. Um, of course, we are in early days, but I think we are making pretty good um, uh, stride in that area. Yeah. If I may add to that, Adam, we are yes in the early stages, but we can see some green lights already in the process. We've just implemented 30 million worth of investments uh, in modernization projects where people from various crops, various functions and various and different centers coming together to develop the initiatives, coming together to implementing the, in the initiatives that utilize the state million to improve uh, modernization of breeding. That is from ABI, coming from BRI, coming from market intelligence, coming even from other, other science organizations like uh, the uh, Resilient Afro -ag Agri Systems. We can see collaboration with people in, G in GI working together in one team and effectively we've implemented with 30 million worth of investments through this process. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, John and Sharifa. Um, okay, so I will turn to uh, Raja Guru and Carolina, and perhaps uh, Raja, you could answer first, and then we'll turn to Carolina. Um, so you you've both both worked with your subject matter now um, for many years before the process teams existed. Um, how does the new approach change your way of working, and what benefits are you seeing? Uh, thank you so much, Adam, and then uh, very good good evening, good good noon, and good night to everyone. So it's a very important question, and then you know uh, it's uh, really good to uh, see how the process team is coming together, uh, especially for the lab services team, uh, right from you know this HTBG period, and then to the module three of excellence in breeding period, and then right now with this breeding research initiative period, uh, we work uh, you know interdisciplinary with all the CGR institutes across all the crops. Right now we have like eighteen plus crops. Imagine, you know, 18 plus crop related uh, molecular scientist and then breeder and then the national partners. So it's a very big network. We are very fortunate to work with the big team, but then we really understood there was so many issues that um, were evolved during the course of period for the last four years. The moment we started the process uh, team, we understood uh, uh, the minor component of the whole big picture and then map all those uh, components into uh, clusters and then see how they talk and then see how the interdisciplinary activity help each other to uh, reduce the barriers what we are facing. So that's the big uh, learning what we have seen uh, when the moment we started the process team. And then the other second one what I can pinpoint is now everyone within the team and then the interdisciplinary team understand each and every one of these component, but there is always a chance that uh, each one understand in a different perspective. So for, for me, the main goal and then the main uh, output of the process team is to make sure all the internal team members understand uh, the components in the rice perspective and everyone on the same page so that that translate to the end service user in a very right way. So this is how I see, uh, you know, how the way of work uh, changed after, before and after the process team. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Yes, and I completely agree with with the points that were raised. And for us, the the big change is the is change our mentality, our way, the way that we used to work in in silos in based on projects. <clears throat> to change that perspective to a more integrated way of working. And in a way, it's a, it's a continuous, it's a, it's a continuous improvement for process where we need to develop a, a common language. We, we expect to leverage our best practices. We expect that collaboration and sharing of data and, and, and our results will be easier in this way. And also we expect to reduce duplications that when mapping our activities, we highlight uh, all these uh, teams that are doing the same uh, activities or in not a very efficient way. So at the end, we expect to increase the quality and efficiency and reducing costs in uh, providing a final product. And in that way, supporting the breeding teams um, in, in delivering more efficient and, and a, a better product. So that's our perspective. OK, thank I you, just Caroline. Want to okay. add oh, one more sure. point uh, as a follow up to Carolina, uh, especially, um, you know, like uh, no, harmonizing the nomenclatures. So each component will have so many, uh, you know, different steps. Uh, someone called, for ex example, in the service uh, request module, someone says it's a service user breeding program. Uh, in the requester. So the one big thing what we have done is to harmonize this nomenclature so that everyone talks in the same language. I just wanted to add this point here. Thanks. OK, thank you, Raja. Um, that's a very good example. Um, so if we turn back to um, uh, John and Sharifa, um, <clears throat> so uh, as leaders um, uh, from Stefan's uh, presentation, he, he talked about how we often have to go through, it's not a choice, we have to go through some bureaucratic and some chaotic moments before we reach our, our final goal of a more cohesive organization. 
And um, how concerned are you that uh, we will go through this bureaucracy phase or we are going through this bureaucracy phase? And if so, uh, what can you guys do as leaders to help manage that? I, I think it's a necessary evil uh, and the diagram uh, that Stefan show, um, showed uh, indicates that as well. And I think uh, I think it's some it, it's like um, building a house. You need to put the this bureaucracy contribute to the foundation of what we want to build. And it's a it's a it's a I would like to say it's a one time thing. You just need to get this this documentation is done, the templates, all how you do this work. And once it's there, it's just a matter of using it um, in your day to day work. And um, it is a painful step, I guess, um, especially for um, an organization like us that's just going into this. Uh, but it, it is something that needs to be done to set the, the foundation for for building a, a new way of working, I would say. Yeah. Uh, how how can we help? Uh, I I think um, it's all time management. I I like to look at it. I mean, it's not something that we are doing this for for just for for the for the sake of doing it. It's it's something that we need to do. And one of the under the the um, uh, as I was I think I mentioned earlier, one one of the thing that GI wants to do is um, make a change on how we how we work. And this will contribute to that. So it's something that we need to go through. Uh, we need to establish these things um, and hopefully, and I'm sure, not hopefully, I'm sure once it's there or when it's done, um, it's in, uh, it'll, it'll be smoother moving forward. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Sharif. Anything to add to that, John? Yeah, uh, I, I can just agree with uh, Sharifa that we, we are in a transformation mode and uh, we're building a new organization, we're building new teams, we're building or we're bringing in new working processes. We have to go through documentation. It's just important that we do that. And we want to come up with clear clarity of operations, who does what, who is responsible for what. So all that calls for some form of documentation, which brings in some bureaucracy. What is important is that in the process, we're building operational efficiency that will take us to the desired state, which in this case would like to be in a state where we are quick to respond uh, to the stakeholders. We'll be able to deliver with speed and also at the appropriate scale. So we have to go through that process, but we'll try as much as possible to minimize the learning curve. And what? how are we doing this? We are using our partners in collaboration. You see that we have some consultant playing some roles here with people in the private sector advising us how they've gone through this process. How do they move picked out of bureaucracy to, to a cohesive organization that is agile enough to deliver with speed and scale? So the partnership model helps us in this, but it, most importantly, we are involving the people who will be doing the actual work, working together throughout the process. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, so we have about 11 minutes or so left in the Q&A. So if, if people uh, in our audience would like to ask a question, please feel free to raise your hand if you have a short question you'd like to ask live um, or put a question or comment in the chat and we'll make sure that the panel addresses it. Um, OK, so um, back to Carolina and uh, Raja Guru. So you're both process stewards. Um, I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about how you see the role and how you see the most important tasks and the vision. And I'm really interested in what might be the same and might, what might be the difference uh, uh, in the way that you approach your roles, one with uh, genotyping service, the other with trialing and nurseries. So how about Carolina, maybe you could, you could start first. In trial and nurseries, we are organizing our protocols. Um, and, and develop our work procedures. And we define processes and sub processes. We map the activities. And based on this, we are now moving to define our uh, sub teams. Um, and we will work very close with them in developing uh, SOPs to map and, and proper document 
all the, the ways uh, and protocols we are following on, on these activities. Um, that create challenges, but well, we, we, we are working on, on, on this process. OK, thanks, Carolina. How about you, uh, Raji Guru? Um, from your perspective, the process steward role, but also um, perhaps you see some things that are a little bit different in Carolyn's role, that Carolina's role that you might want to address. Uh, so yeah, thanks, Adam. So I agree most of the point boy, which Carolyn uh, indicated. So I just wanted to mention, uh, and from my perspective, uh, I see the most important task for the process steward to understand the process which they were related to into the big picture. For example, how this lab services uh, is integrated or serving, you know, the next level of uh, breeding activity, how that is mapped with the, the entire breeding process model. Uh, what are the, the uh, external and internal stakeholders who are involved with this process? And then how in a nutshell this is uh, connected with, you know, the ultimate uh, STG and then the big picture. So to, to digest all these uh, con concepts and then the next uh, main uh, task for the process steward is to translate that understanding to the rest of the internal members and to the rest of the team so that uh, everyone understand where we are really connected so that we don't just work as a silos. So that I see a very important task for a process steward. So that I learned of, uh, during the last few months uh, working with the process consultants and then the process team management. So this one I would say uh, a very important task for a process steward. And then the way I see before and after process network is so likewise about Carolyn mentioned, we are also identifying the sub component of the uh, lab services team and then trying to map the right person and right team as a sub team and then to connect uh, uh, all these dots together to make uh, our process more efficient. Yeah. And it's important to mention that involving each of the participants in this process also motivates them because they feel part of a bigger structure and they completely understand their roles. So that's uh, uh, also a human dimension that also must be like accounted. Yeah, great. The exactly. inclusivity I very aspect much, uh, is very important. Yeah, I very much agree with Carmen, yeah. Okay, great. Um, oh, so uh, we do have a... Oh, yeah, go ahead. If I, can, um, I, I was going to say the same thing as what Carolina was saying. Um, and I think for my eerie friends that, that's here, um, uh, and perhaps others as well that have been track, uh, that have been doing this at their own center previously, just you and your center team, uh, looking at this from that angle only, having a team that's across center, across crops, really um, open up the blinkers that you may have when you're just working on the processes. In your within your own team, uh, because there'll be people who point out uh, things that uh, experiences are different, are varied. So when you put all this together, uh, you get a more robust uh, process uh, being put down rather than something that only you see day in and day out, basically having those blinkers. So um, um, I wish I had this when I was doing that. <laughs> OK, thanks. OK, thanks, Sharifa. Um, so we do have a few questions now in the chat. So um, we're going to start with uh, Harisha's question. Um, and he asks, how do you plan on involving NARS in development of these processes? Um, though I understand CG needs probably to develop their own processes first, but we work through NARS in all areas from product design to delivery. So anyone on the panel like to address that one? Um, maybe I can kick off and others can come in. Um, yes, uh, Harish, thanks Harish for the question. Um, you're right, I think uh, at the moment now we are focused on um, CG centers uh, processes, but essentially as we are going to work with these NARS to develop uh, 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 as, uh, within the breeding networks and so on, they would also have to establish, um, and we are helping them I imagine, 
uh, to establish some of these processes, let, let's say seed production. Those are common things that's, that's, that is, um, CG centers are also doing. So they could participate in, in, in um, some of this, but perhaps um, with teams that are more um, local, I would say. So yeah, uh, eventually we can move there for some of these processes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can so add, add in there. You see that in the product development processes where Sarah N is leading, we are increasingly collaborating with BISH, who connects uh, the process team with the NAS uh, CG network, making sure that we consult with the NAS and we involve them in the process. So it's already something that is part of the, the integral work that we are doing. Thank you. So, yeah, I just want to add uh, one uh, particular component which we consider the NAS. So when we see the process model, we each and every step we consider the national partners, how we are going to integrate them. So if we have a process uh, for each component, we uh, critically see that is it applicable for the NAS? Uh, if it is different, how we are going to tackle that? For example, EBS. So currently the CG uh, have the EBS. When we have uh, connected our data to EBS, uh, we always have a sub process how we are going to address the NARS. So if, it, if there is a data delivery component, uh, if they say this is the model for CG, uh, we also uh, have a component how we are going to uh, address this for NARS. And also uh, the, the first step for the lab service processes, it's too early to announce, but I can still mention that. Uh, the demand uh, forecasting that's going to come from the, uh, the uh, ABA transform team. So that's going to be very well represent the uh, requirement of the national partners. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Yeah, I agree with the comments that at all steps that we are mapping, we are considering a, a potential collaborative work that, or a work that is already done with partners. OK, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, a second question we have from Star. She says, when mapping the processes, how do you document the current process or also design a more optimist, uh, optimized and harmonized process across centers and crops if you're balancing these efforts simultaneously? So I guess the core of the question is documenting the, the current and the new. Perhaps this is can I, more for Carolina or Rajiguru. Yeah, can I take this one? Sure. OK, OK, so yeah, that's a very important question start. So the, the model what we are following to uh, have this workflow is so first we do the baseline uh, assessment and see what's the current working model and then we document it. So for the every changes and every version we make the a new workflow, we always have that uh, initial uh, workflow as a draft document uh, to review for uh, the future, how this is going to be different in the new version. And then uh, the new version, we, when we say harmonized document, that's going to be like an approved version. So we, we have uh, each of this workflow as a, a drafted uh, component in our, uh, you know, like the shared folders or something which is accessible by the, the entire process network. So this is uh, one particular area which we are taking care to make sure we have the current and also the improvised one. And then the next one I would like to take uh, the quote of Eng. So always say that. So this is not just, you know, how the way we work earlier or how we are working. So think in the way that how this should be, uh, you know, worked in the future in a more efficient way, in the more uh, right way, so that address uh, all those concerns which we carried uh, throughout our experience and history. So this is how we uh, think when we develop this workflow. So to put it uh, in a nutshell, we always document and have all those drafts, the, the previous and current and also the future one. Yeah, thanks. And it's important to add a validation process. It's not that we are changing everything from one day to the other. It's a, it's a continuous and we have validation points and approval process for all uh, our protocols that are changed or with the proper documentation. Okay, yeah, thank I, you. I panel. agree with the Caroline, yeah. Sorry, Adam. Great. So I get, agree with Caroline. Uh, so what we are doing currently is uh, 
every moment when we cha have new changes, we make sure the core team and then the sub team uh, review those changes and then agree or review uh, those changes. So to make sure uh, everyone you know understand and then uh, approve those uh, new versions. Yeah. OK, great. Thank you, panel. Um, so we're just at time, but I'm going to I'm going to have one more question, but I encourage you to continue to add questions to the, the chat because if we don't get to them during this session, we will follow up and make sure that we get the answers to you in a written uh, format or, or some other format. Um, so please, any questions, just put them in the chat. Um, but our final one for the panel is uh, from Boja, who asks, um, process management is undoubtedly one of the most important functional apparatuses for GI initiative success towards impact pathways. Um, having talked about silos, uh, Boja's question is to uh, Sharifa and to John, the senior directors. Um, in three points, please tell us how you break the intra and inter initiative silos in the future. Three so your three needed. your three step master plan. <laughs> OK, thanks, Boja. Uh, I think uh, what we are doing here precisely is for that purpose. OK, um, you re remember the breeding process model. So what what I showed um, is the um, kind of like the simplified um, the, the um, higher level view, uh, but within each each of the process categories. So, for example, breeding pipeline. Sarah have done um, uh, uh, breaking it down to the different stage gates. But if you look at um, from uh, the information that feeds into the breeding pipeline is the market intelligence, and we are mapping the specific processes within those things. So you you identify the handover points from each one. So there are there are um, uh, steps where both uh, uh, market intelligence, for example, uh, and the breeding pipeline um, uh, uh, start point, so to speak have to work together to ensure the the handing over is 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 precise and clear and who is responsible for those things as well in fact at this moment um sarah is working with the seed equal side so that uh, we uh, define and identify the steps that is needed to to um when uh, where is the end of breeding and then handing over to handing over to um a seed equal side of the um uh, model so and and similarly as well in in different parts of the the model those kind of handing over points are being identified so that way uh, people are uh, people have to work across initiatives to get those things um um uh, defined and and designed and that will break the silos as well. And that also works within um, the, the, the uh, within the initiatives as, as well. So for example, within BR itself, um, we now, although there are work packages, we now work very little based on those work packages. We are, we are very much a matrix. Everybody's, almost everybody's involved in everything kind of thing. So we know that if we are talking about um, lab services, for example, um, even the teams that are from the data work package, work package four, are involved in that as well to ensure data from lab services that's coming in are, are mapped um, to the breeding process as well. How do they come in? So that's what we are doing now. Thanks. Uh, I don't know about three points, but essentially those are the points. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I think so. Yeah, maybe I can just add. Yeah, you have already, already touched on the three points I was counting. <laughs> I hope I have counted <laughs> okay. properly. But I can also add in that we are also looking at the next opportunity. As we move in the next business cycle of 1CG, we are listening very carefully to both the actors and those who are building these teams where we think we need to integrate processes. But you must also know that at times is some silos can still remain in place. They still be required. Even if you look in the corporate business, there are silos there. But the most important thing is that we build systems and ways to make sure that we remain connected and to deliver as one operation. Because our desire is to operate as one operation, not initiatives, not projects. But in the process, we need to make sure that we are very, very much connected. So our point number one, is this process teams that we are talking about today, making sure that we define how that connection uh, is put in place and it remains working. Adequate communication between our people and to make sure that collaboration and alignment 
is driven through the senders and also through the crops. Thank you. OK, excellent point to end on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John, and thank you, panel. Um, some that was a great discussion and a reminder. If you if you have other questions, please put them in the chat. Um, if we didn't get to them, we will make sure that we follow up in uh, a, a different format and make sure you get you get your uh, responses. So thank you, panel, very much. Um, we're now going to turn a little bit. Uh, we have a guest and our guest is uh, Brian Gardunia, who is the head of cotton production design for Bayer Crop Science. And I know he's done some work with uh, CGIR. He uh, helped us out with a couple of webinars last year. Um, and he has about a 15 minute presentation and then we'll have five minutes uh, discussion with Brian. So um, Brian, I see you're already sharing your slides there. So um, I will just let you go with your presentation. Okay. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Just to make sure. Yeah. All clear. Yes. OK, good. I was a little worried because I'm actually. In the middle of nowhere in Missouri on the way to help my daughter move out of her college apartment to a new apartment, so um, I'm glad that, that that I could be invited um, when young Juan talked to me about this. Um, it was it. I, I'm glad you know it was interesting to think about what it what it was that I would want to say. Um, thought about talking about like process structure and teams that we've had through the years in Monsanto and Bayer. And I, I decided not to do that um, in part because we tend to reorg every two years. So like whatever structure I show or process that I describe probably won't exist as soon as it, I, I talk about it. So what it, instead I, I thought to do was to talk about a little bit about kind of to start with a quick introduction of myself um, and talk about like why I think this thinking about process improvement and continuous improvement is so important for both an organization for making improvements in the breeding program and for the 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 outcomes that we're trying to get with the, that are to trying to make the world a better place. Um, starting with myself, um, I, many of you know me, um, I've I've been to a number of the centers and been involved with 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 projects here and there at, at times, but um, to give some introduction, I started after graduate school as a popcorn breeder. I was a popcorn breeder for three years at a small seed uh, foundation seed business that's from Purdue University, and I was breeding popcorn from Indiana for mostly Argentina and Brazil. Um, after three years, I came to, to Monsanto, and at Monsanto, I took a job that was, at the time, mapping QTLs, essentially. I was a discovery breeder, and at the time, that was what discovery breeding did. And I made it about three weeks into the job when I got reorged, and my life, my my what I thought was my job, kind of got thrown out up in the air, um, and most of my projects were taken away. And I got, you know, it was really a like tough time for me. And and you know, it was, I just started, I just started to get my head around what my program was doing. And Mike Graham came into my office, and he's like, "Look, Brian, you know." I was upset. I was like, look, you pulled the rug out for me. You know, you knew this reorg was changing and you didn't tell me. And uh, he's like, look, like, here's an opportunity for you. He's like, you, if you can, when you meet with your new boss, if you can do three things, he's like, you're going to be really successful at Monsanto. He's like, one, if you can describe what it is you're doing, what it is to, what it is that you want to stop doing, and what are the new things you want to, to do or what are the things you want to keep doing? He's like, you're going to get through this reorg just fine. And um, so I went home and I like quickly like tried to like understand all the things that we were supposed to be doing um, and and to do those three things. And so I've made it through quite a few changes in terms of organization and structure through the years. And my job has really been Whatever my title has been, my job at Monsanto and now at Bayer is still 
looking at the organization, looking at breeding programs and thinking of ways that we can do things differently and we can change how we're running those breeding programs. And and that's been a lot of like changes that have been impactful and some of them have been quite disruptive. We do a lot of like kind of people development and leadership development things as as part of the job at Monsanto and Bayer. What you see on the screen here is um, a self-evaluation results that, that we did a couple of years ago with a consulting group called Corn Fairy. And I thought it was quite insightful and it, it, it diagnosed me quite well, but it was a surprise to my colleagues because I've spent my whole career at, at Monsanto for the last 14 or 15 years being disruptive, like taking the processes that we're doing and trying to really radically change them and trying to transform teams and people. And I'm this black dot that that is in the like core stabilizer category, which and the other gray dots are some of my fellow leaders at Bayer. And people were really surprised at that, especially when if you looked at my personality profile, I'm like the extreme of agility. I'm really comfortable with change. I'm very comfortable with not having the answers and having a like a set structure. And um, but I also really want change to be like not to break the things that are important and that work. And um, so this is where I've been in in in, and I think it's part of why I've been discuss why I've been somewhat successful at Bayer is this this a bit of tug and pull of wanting to change but also not wanting to change and have those changes not break the good things that I like about the organization and about the team so um, I think that tension has been healthy for me but sometimes a little bit stressful um, also when we think about change and in in a breeding program Change is always hard, like it is, you know, and I, I think of change in two different ways. There's things that are like continuous improvement that we're making stepwise changes, um, updates to how we do something. And then there's changes that are really disruptive and that feel much harder because it requires like a lot of downstream changes to processes. And this is a bit of an analogy, but it's also, I think, the truth in that we see this if you look at historic breeding programs and impacts, you see things that are both continuous improvement, which I think is what we see in genetic gain. Um, it's genetic improve, continuous improvement in the germplasm and in selection, but I, I, I think there's a component of that that also is continuous improvement in the methods and the how of what we're doing, especially because as we make selections, it actually gets harder to maintain that that linear increase in genetic gain, either because you're you're losing diversity or because like it just gets harder to select because you have more traits that are like in conflict with each other. And maintaining that as linear takes, I think, an attitude of continuous improvement. It, it requires us to be continually thinking and problem solving how we're gonna make our breeding program successful over time. And then you can see here like three kind of disruptive changes that happened over corn breeding from transitioning from open pollinating to open pollinated populations to double cross hybrids and from double cross hybrids to single cross hybrids. Those were really disruptive changes. It really changed how you had to think about both the seed business, how we were making selections, what was important for selection and and had a lot of downstream effects in lots of ways on how a, the both the business and the the science of a breeding program ran but the effects of that has been phenomenal and and, it, and it's important for us to remember that you know managing both continuous improvement and disruptive changes what's going to make us successful um i have a couple of case studies that i wanted to give and i i wanted to start with this one because it seems really simple. Like when I started in the business um, out of graduate school, we 
when we were counting seed for what was going to get planted in nursery or in a yield trial, this was our tool of choice. This is this is a seed counter that you know it's it's pretty efficient. It's pretty fast. Um, you stick the packets on the bottom and you put the seed in the top and the seed falls down and it counts it as you go and you can rapidly trade out seed packets. Um, we did a lot of counting the seed on the counter too, but this process has gone through a lot of evolution over the last 10 years for us at, at Bayer. You know, when I very first started, we still hand wrote on a lot of envelopes. Um, and then we moved to printing labels and having labels that we would stick onto all the envelopes. And I can remember sitting and sticking labels for, you know, a whole day ahead of starting to count nursery because we would print them with the pack printer and then we would stick them on the envelopes. And that evolved to very quickly. We had we found a machine that would like stick the labels for us. So that saved some time. Then we figured out that, well, we could just print directly onto the packet. And so ended up getting these packet printers that we could run the packets through and print directly onto the packets. And when we started having barcoding for everything, then we needed to print that barcode onto the packet so that we could scan them and we could put them into in in into order. And, and then we developed a custom counter that, that I don't have a picture of, I'm afraid, but it was one that could could read that barcode and then it could adjust the number of seed that was going into each packet based on what was in the database for that that packet, which was really convenient because then you could count nursery and yield trial and different kinds of observation plots essentially at the same time. And that saved a lot of time. We had different innovations for how we handled randomization over the years. And then we moved from packets to these like trays for nursery. And then we moved to these cassettes as a way to do, do yield trials. And what started as like continuous improvement of a pretty like seemingly simple process has become a really disruptive change in how we run our breeding programs. What you see is on the left that that simple seed counter, and then on the right is the the seed packaging center that's in Urbandale, Iowa, and um, essentially 100% of what we count today for North America goes through this facility. Um, what used to take us weeks and months to do, for example, we can count in this facility for cotton. It took us four days to count all of the nurseries and all the yield trials um, for for this year's planting. And it's it really was disruptive in a lot of ways because it changed how we thought of the, the workload at a station. It required then centralizing how we stored seed. It changed the role of a research associate significantly because, you know, managing the the, the labor and the time of counting and organizing packets was a big part of their jobs and now that was gone essentially because that became automated um another disruptive change was when we started testing um, genomic prediction in 2010 what we quickly realized was that once we implemented these genomic prediction in a breeding program that that would eliminate at least one stage of testing and it would also replace a lot of but what we thought of in terms of like how we made selections and what we phenotyped because now running that model became almost more important than what you advanced because having good prediction accuracy meant was really a big driver of of what was important in your breeding program and it changed how we thought of the importance and the value of of doubled haploids. When I started, the, there were only a couple of programs that were majority in corn breeding for doubled haploids. Now, globally, I think probably 90 plus percentage of the of the lines that are in in testing come through through doubled haploid, and and those are now chipped. So we the one of the improvements that we we put to that process was thinking about well what's the optimal time to chip for value and we started chipping before we double it, doubled and so we would chip the seed before doubling select with genomic prediction and then double and that that allowed us to think about okay instead of doubling in the field we're going to we're going to have 
many fewer plants to double and we need high um, doubling efficiency so we can move a lot of that into protected culture and and that shifted again a lot of downstream operations and it also shifted how we thought of testing and testers and how what kind of you know nursery operations we needed um, one thing in the culture where we're essentially experimenting on ourselves and how we're running our processes and trying to make changes in them, we do have to realize that we're going to make changes that end up uh, that are that, that that weren't the right change. So one of the projects I inherited and worked on when I first joined the company was trying to figure out something to do with Green Snap. We made a whole bunch of different machines and I I put this one in. We did file a patent on this one, but ultimately this machine was a terrible mistake. Like it required tons more work. It didn't actually measure what we thought it was measuring. Um, we thought it was working and we put this into practice. And then we had to, once the data started to show that there was probably a different way that we needed to think about this problem, we actually had to retire this machine in the process. So we like went through the work of like testing and validating and then um, putting this into deployment, building SOPs, planting nurseries, all the like stuff to like build out a process for using this this mechanical green snap in, in machine. And then after two seasons decided, you know, this isn't what we're going to do. And, and this was actually a bad idea. Like it's actually hurting us to select with this machine and we had to stop and and rethink this process and and part of what makes a culture where you're trying to do continuous improvement and you're trying to make changes is being willing to accept that some things that you're going to do are not the right thing and being willing to go back and say okay let's rethink that and make that change I think one of the biggest reasons to build continuous improvement into our culture and into our strategy, whatever the structure and the organization of it is, is, is really because it's it's to make the place that we work a better place. And it's a it's it's a better environment for people. It gives the opportunity for development and growth at all the different stages, at all the different kind of levels in the program. It, it's from the top all the way down to the very bottom is what you really want is for people at all those stages to be actively thinking about how to make improvements in the way that they do their jobs. And there's probably two reasons for that. One is it's going to help make new improvements and you'll get ideas and generated from all levels in the organization. It isn't like any one person has a monopoly on good ideas. The the other thing though is it builds a culture where people can go through change and 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 it and when there's a big change that happens that is disruptive, people become are are able to go through that process. And this change curve is one that you know we discuss a lot from from HR in terms of like when we do have a reorganization where, or we have a, a big process change that we're trying to implement that there, there there's this like, kind of like a, almost a grief process sometimes that people go through where they like have an emotional reaction to that change. And, and they're there at first, they learn about something and they go through this like dip where they're unhappy uh, with about the change and they either accept the change and become engaged again, and then get back into a mode where they're committed and happy with the change, or they become checked out and either leave the company or or change roles or do something where they, they don't have to no longer be engaged. And I think that one of the biggest reasons to build this into like the, the strategy and the structure of an organization is to help this change curve be like minimized as much as possible. You wanna keep people from having to be at a low point in their career or in their, you know, emotionally when they're at work, right? So if continuous improvement is part of the culture, 
when there's a strategic shift, when there's a, a bureaucratic shift, it helps people to go through this change curve faster because they they can start to think about it in terms of a way how it is helping for continuous improvement and it helps get people back into like you know an engaged committed um emotional and and both workspace headspace um that's really all in terms of like presentation that I had. I, I, I did want to like open it up if there were any questions. I, I know I don't have tons of time, so I I probably at the edge of my time or past. So um, I think okay, there's thanks. a lot of ways that you could implement these things and there's a lot of places that you could think about how to implement continuous improvement. So um, I'll, I'll stop here and and see if Adam there's has questions from the chat or, or from other um, just from the phone. Sure, thank you, Brian. That was an excellent presentation, uh, especially um, appreciate the very tangible case studies that you that you put forward. Um, we do have time for maybe two, three questions. Uh, we have one already from Raja Guru who asks and Raja Guru is uh, on one of our process teams as a process steward. Um, and he asks with your vast experience in process management and continuous improvement, What's your advice to young professionals who are just entering this field of process teams? I think the the biggest advice is just to be engaged, to to not get frustrated with the like feeling like change is being forced upon you, but to find ways for that to both be something that's enriching to your career in the process because you are going to be you're going to have ways that you can develop and learn new things through 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 this like process management and thinking about continuous improvement and also I, I think it makes us better scientists like it it is what we want to do as scientists is to think about you know and challenge you know the status quo and and that's part of what this is should be for okay Thank you, Brian. Um, another question from Sarah Hearn, who uh, is also on one of our process teams, I believe as a process steward, and she asks, um, what would you offer on thoughts of prioritization of continuous improvement? How do I, how do we prioritize across the many opportunities for change? I think you can, you can, it's probably two levels. I think the first priority should be changes that are relatively painless right because they're not expensive to do it's we should always encourage small changes that make continuous improvement at the like basis level then when you get up to changes that are going to require resources both in terms of time money uh, physical investment in capital it, you have to look at it like any change it's what's going to be the most impactful what's going to help the organization either move forward or get more value or save money or save time in the long run. And then those are the things that you invest in first. OK, so it sounds like you need to get the criteria straight before you make those decisions. Yeah. OK, um, all right, so um, I'll just end with one one last sort of big picture question. Um, listening to this session and working with CGIR in general, um, do you have any observations or advice for the approach that we're taking right now? Um, I think it's the the change is hard, right? And I it is hard for people sometimes. And I think in a more the more like an academic setting, and I don't think CGR is really an academic setting. It's it's a research driven organization, but sometimes those structures can get kind of calcified, like they kind of begin to exist for really longer periods of time than in a than in a business in a company. So when there's these like structure changes, it, it feels really hard for people and, and, and it probably is harder because there is more rigidity in the structure. And and I guess my advice would be try to like embrace the ways that the like change process can both improve like the the stuff that we do but also the culture so when there's 
parts of the like culture that we we don't like that that is part of our our like attitude about what we want to continually improve great wise words Brian. um thank you um okay so fa fantastic presentation uh and really appreciate your responses to the questions um there are a couple questions we didn't get to but again we'll, we'll try to make sure we address those in um in different ways in, in the future um so thank you very much to brian uh, gardunia um and now we have reached the end of our session um but we have a few minutes of wrap up from our um direct senior director of uh, plant breeding and pre-breeding. So I'll hand it over to John for a few minutes of wrap up. John. Thank you so much, Adam, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I would like to take this time to thank everyone uh, for attending this. I'm sure it has been very, very productive uh, in sharing knowledge, communicating what we are doing in process teams. And also, most importantly, uh, for Brian for sharing the experience that he has gone through in Monsanto and now Bayer going through this process and it doesn't reach an end. It's always a continuous thing. We're always on the journey when it comes to the change. But what I want just to encourage all ourselves that let's all remain engaged as advised by Brian here so that we are part of the, the change and shape the processes together through this opportunity uh, that we are creating to make sure that we are all involved in teams, not only one team. We are involved in so many different teams that we are working on. So it's in, in one way, this is this is shaping our new culture, a culture of engagement and a culture of developing a shared vision together. So that's the process that we are going through and the continuous improvement. Uh, we are also embracing it in all aspects uh, from our gymplasm improvement or people development and also process and innovation improvement. So it's something we are cultivating together. So when listening to the questions people are asking here, it's quite good that we are learning together. And my advice is let's keep on engaging, let's keep on reflecting and sharing those views. We as leadership, we are open uh, to all views people have. We work together to find solutions so that we minimize the learning curve and get to the desired state which we are indicating here that our desire is to echo as one cohesive organization that is efficient in implementing its operations uh, and deliver at scale with speed. Otherwise, thank you very much uh, for attending this webinar. We we'll organize more in the future. Thank you. Back to you, Adam. OK, thank you very much, uh, John. Um, so as we've learned, um, transformation is not an easy process. Um, and so we are going through some growing pains. We're getting out of those growing pains. We're starting to see real results. And um, I think today's uh, panelists and presentations um, gave us a good idea of uh, what some of those results are starting to look like. Um, so I thank everybody who attended the session, particularly those in Mexico and Philippines who are on the furthest extremes of the time zones and everyone else. Um, it's been a really great session uh, and I wish everyone a good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good weekend. And thank you for uh, joining us today.